Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 346 for Monday, May 23rd, 2022. And welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab. Welcome back for all of us. We had a little time off. I had a little bit of travel and all that good stuff. We are the show for, by, and about working musicians and back here in Durham, New Hampshire, albeit briefly. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. How are we today, Mr. Kent? Well, I'll tell you, before we talk business here, I just have to congratulate you. Your awesome, freaking awesome daughter has graduated college, and I saw the photos you shared, and I know how close you guys are, both, you know, your whole family, and just, it, it must have been a great weekend for the Hamiltons. It was. It was a, yeah, it was a great weekend. We uh, we had a bunch of people over to the house here after the uh, after the ceremony, and yeah, it was, it was, a, it was really nice. It was, and you know, it's a, it's a moment. It's a pretty, Shoot. pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, she, it is. She did something I have yet to do. So, you know, there you well, go. The few times that I've, I've had to, you know, work with Sky, talk to Sky, interact with, she's just amazing young woman. And uh, I'm sure she has a great future ahead of her. Yeah. Congratulations to the Hamiltons. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, you know, it's that time of year. So we did that. We moved our son, <laughs> moved our son out of, uh, out of school out in Portland. And while I was out there, I got the opportunity to go all the way back to, I think, episode 46, which was from 2016, uh, when we interviewed the Coffis brothers. I, you know, I, I, I've stayed connected with them and listened to their music and all of that stuff and happened to see a post from them on Facebook about a week before we left for Portland that they were doing a tour of Oregon. And I thought, well, there's no way. And sure enough, way, uh, I got to see them on Wednesday the 11th up in uh, up in Portland, and it was it was wonderful to get to meet them, which you know is always a cool thing. It's great to get it's great to get to meet a band that you've been listening to for a while. It's great to get to meet people who listen to the show. So there was you know we had the mutual admiration society going on the whole night, and that was fantastic. And they put on just a spectacular show. They, you know, they are. To me, they're like the perfect blend of like roots rock and power pop. They, and, and, you know, yeah. they, they, they've got uh, – there's three people who sing in the band and two brothers and, and then the bass player. And all three of them sing very well together. But, you know, the foundation of those blood harmonies between the, the two Coffus brothers just really – that, that's the thing to me that adds the power pop side of it. I mean, they, some of their songwriting and – and all of that definitely, you know, borrows from from power pop, but it's it's roots rock with uh, with a sense of humor, and I I with a, with a roots rock with a tongue and a cheek, and I like it. It's good. So I just want to talk about my friends, the Coffus Brothers, and for anyone who never has not heard the story, um, when they were really just starting out. So this is probably 2014, maybe. Okay. Um, they open. They open for uh, the House Rockers at at, uh, at a local concert series, uh. and and you know immediately, yeah, those harmonies caught my ear. Their guitar player Kyle, you know, clearly had some chops, and so we actually had Kyle on stage to sit in with us, and and they were really young, and they were um, really flattered that we were very complimentary to them. Uh, Jamie and Kellen Coffin's dad sent me a nice note because I because we gave him some shout outs sure. and you can just tell that these were these were good people who had a lot of talent and a lot of potential and so started a relationship with them and it turns out that um, we the both Kellen and and, um, and Jamie are are actually the whole band but particularly the brothers are huge Tom Petty fans along with me and so we had this kind of in common and we've you know exchanged messages over over the years. Uh, whenever they would just come out to hear the house rockers, we would always have them at least do a song. Uh, we played a wedding of uh, of someone who's kind of in their orbit, and uh, and and Jamie came up and sang "American Girl." So oh, kind yes. of this long history. I just and I just love them as people. They're just they're crazy talented. They're they're very soulful. And you know my my kind of litmus test for things that break through are how real people are as a as a product of the environment that they're representing. So these guys grew up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and which is a very laid back area and when I hear them play 
they they sound like where they're from to me. I mean, it does have that kind of, that that when you say roots, I guess that that would be kind of it. You know, I, I, it's more it, that's more just rock and roll to me. Um, but they write some beautiful ballads. They just sound like the truth to me. You know, th- we say three chords in the truth. Yeah, I would say that that's that's two brothers in the truth. Like they just yeah. emote emote what they know and what they see. Their songwriting was always strong, but I think it kind of gets better with each album. I think they just put out their fifth album. Um, it gets better and more interesting with each one. They sing the. I, I'm going to put a link. Beautifully. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the the video that they put out for a, a tune called Ramona, in uh, which is on their most recent album. Yeah, and it is That's it is good pop song. brilliantly written. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Like, it's got it's got everything. It's got the 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 roots rock at its core, the power pop harmonies, the power pop lyric style lyrics. It's just fantastic. Really, really well done. And if you search through YouTube for for different things that they've put out, there are a number of like like unplugged or you know I- interesting formats that they've done some very professional looking videos. Yeah. You can tell it's them, though. I mean, there's no shine or post production that really, you know, is 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 hides them. them. Yeah, no, it's them. nothing's yeah. hiding. Yeah, it's good. So I have nothing but love for those guys, and you know, I frankly I don't understand why they haven't taken two more notches up. I mean, they're touring with the guy from the Mother Hips, you know, quite a bit and working with him. He produced their last album, but to me, you know, they should be on some major tours, and and uh, and hopefully they'll still get there. I mean, they're still young, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, good guys. I wish them all the best and just mad, mad love for them. So two interesting things happened while uh, while I was watching that. Well, many interesting things happened. We enjoyed their their set immensely. But uh, at one point, they asked, uh, <laughs> tongue in cheek and sort of joking, are there any harmonica players out there? This may be the reason that they haven't broken through, Paul, to answer your question, because because you, you never ask that question <laughs> because because the worst thing that can happen is that someone in the room says yes. Now, it was uh, while uh, Kellen was going and, and looking for his harmonica that, that Jamie uh, asked this question on stage. So it was it was a question that had a built in answer and did not require someone from the crowd to get up. But it was just one of those things. That, as soon as he said it, it was like. Why would you even utter those words? Like that's like saying Macbeth in a theater. Like you just don't do that. <laughs> that's bad luck. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing that happened was they were as they were sort of bantering between songs, they realized that they had three songs in a row in the same key. And it it made me think about setlist creation and all the conversations we have about that. Uh, I remember when I was, and I, I mean, I'm, you know, there's always thoughts about set list crafting and some of them get, you know, very nuanced and very band specific and all of those things. But I remember back when I was in the responders, we had a rule that no more than two songs in a row by the same artist we played in that band. Uh, it was, we played a lot of Beatles, Stones and, uh, and Tom Petty in that band. And then, you know, many other bands sort of peppered in, but we had, we could do a full set of the Beatles or a full set of the stones if we wanted to, but we had to be really careful uh, to not unintentionally wind up with a set list that had like, you know, five Beatles tunes in a row. Again, unintentionally, there were times where that made perfect sense to do, but it was easy to happen by accident. And it made me think like, you know, do you worry about having too many songs in the same key when you play Paul? Um, Worry about it, no, but uh, I am, I am conscious that it is a consideration. So, yeah. you know, okay. our set lists have somewhat eased into a kind of a rhythm and, you know, the uh, guitar keys are, you know, pretty much pretty similar, right? You know, right. You're not doing a lot of A flat and, you know, F sharp, and, you know, the, it, so, but uh, it makes sense to me that, do you remember when we had a conversation about how I think about sets when I play solo things yeah, and how I think about how I, you know, I, I you know, what are, what songs are capoed, what songs are finger picked. So yeah. the concept of, of oral a U R a L variety is definitely in my mind. Um, but I don't sit down and say those three, three songs are in the key E let's not do that. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, but, yeah. To the same point, I, my, my brain would take me away from doing that in the first place. Yeah. And you wouldn't want, you know, the three mid tempo navel gazers in a row either. A- again, not unintentionally. They're, they're what are not these be- things you speak of? 
the, the mid tempo songs that the I, I call them the navel gazers. I'm not from, I'm not familiar with the shoe gazers, the the set killers. <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> But they can be like to, if, if this if it's if one of those songs you know a, a mid tempo tune or slower tune placed well can really be a nice breath of fresh air in the midst of you, you know an, an energetic sort of frenetic set so it, like they have their place but th- you got to be careful with them and it has to be the right song too so yeah it's interesting um, I have a PSA for everybody Paul. And that is more than more than the harmonica thing. More, well, I mean, that's like table stakes, guys. So, yeah, I think I think <laughs> once, once the Coffus Brothers clear that up, they are now destined for, you know, for the stars. So you're welcome, guys. And you deserve all your success. It's great. Uh, the uh, I, I went with my wife actually to get uh, molds made of our well, my ears again and hers for the first time. She's getting some uh, custom fit earplugs which is like something we should have done a long time ago. We see a lot of shows together and she comes to a lot of shows. I don't know why we, we haven't done this for her in the past, but anyway, we got her ears molded and it was fine. And I'm getting another set of things made. And so I needed new molds and I, uh, I did not think to clean my ears before I went to this appointment and they could not mold my ears. I, it's not uncommon for me to collect cerumen, AKA earwax and, uh, in my ears and I, my left ear tends to collect more of it than my right, though. I've certainly had clogs in both ears. And the first time I had a clog, I thought I, you know, had just instantly gone deaf. And, uh, and then my dad was like, Oh, this happens to me too. And I was like 17 or something. So used a little bit of peroxide to soften things. And then just did a little, um, an ear syringe to, to sort of flush things out gently. And it usually just comes right out and it's not, not a big deal. But as soon as I did that, and I noticed it even today listening to, and I, it was, it was a few days ago that I did this, but, uh, but even, you know, doing the show here, I think this might be the first podcast I've recorded since I did it. And I'm hearing a lot more sibilance here. I'm hearing a lot, you know, so it's just one of those things it, it as, especially if we are doing things routinely where we are clogging our ears intentionally with either, you know, in your monitors or ear plugs that prevents the wax from leaving. And if you're doing that while you're also like sweating and all of that, you may wind up collecting more than your fair share of wax deeper in your ear. And so, you know, be safe. Don't use a Q-tip. Like that's step Mm -hmm. one. Uh, A Q-tip's just going to push it all back in. So you want to, you know, use like a, an ear syringe or, or you could obviously have a doctor do it too, but it's, it's fairly easy to, to flush it out, flush it out, not flush it out, flush it out yourself. But just one of those things, um, you know, probably something for us in ear monitor wearing people to do at least once a year, maybe more often, depending on Makes how sense. things go. Yeah, I just figured I'd share. Plus, pretty gross stuff, man. The stuff that gets in the whew. in the port going into the into your in ears. Yeah. Oh, dude, like that is is but the tip of the iceberg. Uh, <laughs> the chunks that I have seen come out of my ear. We've now turned off all the listeners, and but it, but we already told them to listen to the Coffee Brothers, so it's totally fine. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've hey, ruined we've ruined lunch or dinner for somebody. That's right. Yeah, it may even be me. Uh, but hopefully, it's not Gord. Gord wrote in after listening to our conversation in the last episode about the uh, you know the venue staff having a defining influence on the evening, and Gord said. I thought I'd send you guys a quick email about the venue safety security bar staff discussion. One rule our band has implemented early on is that we do not play any venue where we wouldn't go to have a beer ourselves. It's a rule that has served us and anyone who is kind enough to come and see us quite well over the years. So that's Gord from Canada. Thank you, Gord. I, that's a great, that, you know, it's a good litmus test. If you're, if you it want, is a good litmus test. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to add to that conversation yeah. because we're, we're going through something with a venue right now. So let's see. The <laughs> venue um, has a new owner. Yep. And the new owner is kind of an absentee owner. Okay. Uh, and he has other businesses and, and, um, and he's not the one really driving. He's hired someone to do talent, you know, booking. And the booking person, the booking cur- person means well. And I, it's my impression that the booking person's opinions are leading into other aspects of the, of the venue. Anyway, yep. we're going to move forward on this. And, and I, I'll say that 
few things. A whole bunch of stuff was agreed to with the new owner. Okay. Over time, I'm being asked to change some of that stuff. The worst of which was there was a there was a date that we had. I got a, this is while I was the owner was still preparing to take ownership, and you know the call came over and said, "Hey, you know, I, I booked a private party. Will you will you play on the Thursday inf- instead of the Saturday?" And I was like, "That's a pretty big difference, you know. N- wow. No guarantee on the draw on the Thursday." Anyway, we go we go to the Thursday, and then this is this three months has gone by, and I just got a call recently that um, nope, Thursday is going to be salsa night. Uh, we have to cancel. So, you know, it's too, it's too close in for anybody who, you know, book like the guys in my band who do solos, you know, they're not going to be able to replace that date. Yeah. So a cancellation um, is a big red flag because you've changed your mind. Because what booking is actually, you know, what, you know, does this mean you reserve the right to, if you get a private party, does this mean you reserve the right if, uh, you know, a mid-level touring band wants to come through? So so this is a big red flag. Add to that, originally, the date was uh, 7 to 10 p.m., and then I had recommended that once Daylight Savings Times comes, it go to 8 to 11 because nobody will come, you know, to a club to, to dance when it's bright out. And, you know, this place has big windows, and so it's bright sure. out almost until dusk, right? Yep. So I said, go to, let's go 8 eight eight to um, 8 to 11. That was agreed to. And then I got a call saying, nope, we want it to be 8 to 12, but you can play the same number of sets. Um, just, you know, put longer music on in between. It's not huge, but it's another change. And I'm adding these things together. Um, and oh, and then the final thing, actually, here's, here's the biggest thing. I'm getting calls asking how ticket sales are going. Now, for years, we've played this venue with no advanced tickets. And the venue, I think, you know, I think they want to know how to staff their their venue on any given night, and they've certainly had some some lemons and nights. But all of a sudden, I'm getting called. We did our first one recently, and we sold advanced tickets. And you know, it was it was, you know, we've been playing this play for years, and advanced tickets were never a, a thing. Yeah, and advanced tickets were a little anemic. It ended up being a good night, but you know, they're a little anemic. But the Clear stress and tension going in both directions with three calls the week of, how are tickets, how are tickets, how are tickets. Oh. Add, add those three things together. Again, I get, I get any one of those things. Right, right. Yeah, these, but, these but, things but, all but, happen. You know, you, yeah. Well, you, remember, you, you, you teach people how to treat you. So if you put up with that type of stuff, even if it's not meant viciously or, or facetiously or, or you know, you know, in, in a negative way, the net net now gives a the net net now gives an impression about what the business approach to dealing with the the talent is, what the, dealing with the bands are, yeah. and so now now the red flag is just pretty much the top of the uh, of the of the flagpole. Yeah, we, I've I've you met you went through quite a few things here. The, I I've I've been through this obviously. I mean, it, it happens. The example that comes to mind is the club right down the street from my house, the Stone Church. Uh, in Newmarket, they, when we first started dealing with them, they were with one set of owners and, and they, that has since changed. Uh, but you know, when, when we first started doing our, all our fling fest there, there was a woman that worked for them. She was not in an, in an ownership position, and, but she was managing all of the, the bands and schedules in house. And she was great. She, she saw a vision similar to what we saw and like her, her, idea for running that room fit with the types of things that we wanted to bring to that room with, with fling fest and all that, which was great. It re- really went well. Then she went off to nursing school and ultimately I, I'm pretty sure this is why, well, I don't know anything. I'm just speculating that this is why the the then owners decided to sell because she had actually made that place profitable and they were like, all right, the, the books look good. Put it on the block quick, you know, uh, yeah. which is smart. I mean, it's fine, right? You, you know, it's, that, that's, that, there's nothing uh, malicious about that, but I, that was, that was my assumption. I have no idea if that's actually true, but, um, they, in, in the interim, when, between when she left and when, uh, the, you know, the new owners picked up the place and started, started doing their thing there, they quickly hired a third party, you know, outside booking agent 
And that person came in and was just like, okay, well, we're just going to homogenize this. It's going to be the same as every other club. We're just going to, you know, it's going to be fine. We're just going to fill the nights and everything's going to be, you know, fit into these tidy little boxes because the person wasn't booking for just the stone church. They were booking for, I don't know, 10, 15 clubs or something. And and they wanted to, you know, make it all work the same. And it, the nature of that room therefore changed immediately and it changed while we had gigs booked, like, you know, like you're talking about here. So it was it was all all of these arrangements were made with one set of management. And then there was this change and it was like, OK, you know, and the first one kind of worked OK. The second one was less so. And then I think the third one was the booking agent working under the the now owners. And so things got really weird and it was like, okay, the, the, the nature of this room is changing. It doesn't fit what we're doing here anymore. And so we had to find other menus for it, which was fine. But yeah, you start seeing those red flags. Um, the, and, and yeah, you, you're absolutely right that you've got to be, you got to be careful how you teach people to treat you. The, so the, getting, getting back to our, our, our listeners' comments, so here's the interesting question. If you play music for a living, do you just consider a venue business and mm. you just say, you know, it's a booking, I, I have a contract, everything's clear, I don't have to like the people I do business with, right? Or, you know, I, I'd be interested if the person who shared that comment is like, listen, I don't need the stress. You know, this isn't my living. You know, I'm going to only put myself into situations that everything about that situation is acceptable to me. And, and that's how I'm going to make my booking decision. So, you know, yeah, we live in this interesting world where it's, where, you know, even pros, I know they have what they will and what they won't put up with, but that list is actually pretty, it's pretty refined and real because, you know, if you start, I don't like the waitresses there. I don't like the bartenders there. I don't like, you know, the load in here. I don't like, you know, sure. if, you know there's one thing about every place that someone in your band could be like, nope, not cool. Yeah. Um, no, so. it's a slippery slope. But I, but I think I think we're missing a big a big issue here is that, you know, Gord's litmus test, I, I don't think is as much about Gord. At least I didn't take it that way. I took it as being, listen, you know, this is business and I have my audience that follows me around and goes to these different venues. If well, I, right. If I start telling my audience, I don't care about them as much as I care about me. Right. I wouldn't yeah. come here, but you can, right. That's a great point. Now you're going to like, now that that's a, that is a business decision. That's how I was looking at this. Uh, I had no idea how Gord was looking at it to be perfectly yeah, yeah. honest. And but, so to reflect on what you're just sharing, I would say a, a thousand percent. So, you know, this venue is a venue that wants you to sell tickets. Yeah. And then, so to ask the question is, do I want to sell tickets to my fans to this place? Or is there a better place to do it? Or is you it, know, yeah, if know, that's going to be the deal, then, you, that, yeah. That's a really good point. Is, and, and, and to the ticket, the, the point about tickets, you know, I my guess is, there's a variety of reasons you mentioned they want to know how much to staff the place. Well, as we all know, it's tough to ha to find staff for pretty much anything right now. So that that's a that's a different concern than it was three years ago. Right. You know, do we because we have to decide we have limited number of staff. So, you know, I can't work all the people all the time. Otherwise, you know, they'll quit and go work somewhere else with better working conditions. So I have to choose. All right. I'm going to have two people on Thursday night. I need to have four people on Friday night. Maybe one of them can be the same as Thursday. Right. You're doing this Tetris of, of you know, managing your staff and their workload. So the idea of if are they worried about ticket sales mainly so that they know how many people to have working or is it and it could be both. Right. Uh, or is it that people they're, they're worried about, you know, what's what is the revenue going to look like for that night and uh, and wanting to be in more of a partnership with the band on that, uh, which I, I there's if, if nothing that's the case. That's not how it came across. Right. right? So that right. it was more panicked about solve my problem and make my business risk free, which yeah. is kind of silly because that's only one part of the data. Right. Right. <laughs> Again, the other part of the data is, you know, we have a pretty long history of good draws there. How are you going to factor in? You know, how are you going to factor in walk-ups to make sure the people that we have sold tickets to get a good experience when we go there? Right. So if, if it's a two-way street, it's a two-way street, right? It's not, 
and that's the deal. You know, when a when a when a venue says, you know, you're going to play for the door, right? First, you got to figure out if that's worth it to you or doable for you. Yep. Second of all, you got to. You're right. Absolutely, you got to figure out if it's it going to be a good experience because you will. You only might get that once. If you if you tell your people come come to this place and it's terrible, they might not come again. They, right? and, and they might not come to the next place. Like it doesn't. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, but I, but you know, the they, deal is, it's, it, it, I, my read on it is that they wanted a risk free night. Yeah. That's why they don't pay the bands and they want the bands to you know to you know sell tickets. They get they get the door, the door but they sell tickets. But it is not the band's job. And if you're going to have that conversation, like I said, three calls in a week, that just creates an, an aura of tension, you know, between Booker and band. It's going to be what it's going to be by the time you're a week in. Oh, yeah. And so have the conversation afterwards and, you know, let's talk about it. How did you market it? You know, it, it can give you any thoughts as to why it was different than you thought it was going to be. You know, all the, there, if it's going to be a business discussion, it should be a business discussion. It was just like, yeah. tell me again, how you know, like when, when, when the club comes off stressed about it. It's definitely, you know, it creates a vibe when you walk in the club. It creates a vibe when you play. And, you know, there's a lot, you know, that that, that is created. And don't call it a partnership if it's not a partnership. And and I would say that this. this yeah, what well, you're, really yeah, the, 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 the very specific scenario that, that you brought in, that, that sounds like a, I, I think you're right with the red flags. I think that's, you know, a bad deal. I, the so, it, more, more generically, I think we all should expect to see a lot more of of these true partnerships where 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 everybody involved knows it's a partnership and treats it that way. So different from what you just described, but but that ho- this whole thing about ticketing an event and everybody sort of if with everybody having a risk in the scenario, I, I think yeah. that's 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 something I'm seeing more and more of now than I did pre-COVID. And it makes sense, right? You know, everybody's kind of, there's been a reset of a lot of different things. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, It sounds like the scenario you're in is, is a crappy version of this, but, but there's a lot of great versions of this, but to your point, Paul, if it's a business conversation, make it a business conversation, right? Everywhere. Everybody's knows that, okay, we're, we're forming a partnership for the evening, right? Right. You know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be a five-year partnership where, you know, we're, we're opening up our books to each other, but for this right. one evening, you know, it is a partnership to make the night a success. So let's work on that and let's do what we each can do to make that happen. And, and, you know, I you debrief, you don't, and then you, you know, debrief, having been in yeah. events, yeah. I having been in events for many, many years and we can call this an event. The week of is not the time to create any kind of stress, right? No. No, like you know, no. if there was a business discussion that was like, hey, you know, if say, you know, or 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 codify it and say, listen, if your sales are less than X a week before, you know, we suggest you know taking it out here or doing that or you know, like like it, the venue wants to guide its own success in this matter. Yeah, because ninety nine percent of the bands, you know, cover bands aren't doing anything extraordinary except you know creating a a web post or Facebook post or something like that, you know? So if the, if the, if the venue truly has an interest in, in putting a strategy behind how to help bands be successful so they can be successful and they yeah. can know how to staff the damn band, their damn bar, um, you know, <laughs> don't just call and say, how are ticket sales? Right. That's just, that's just. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Rookie. Yeah, yeah. 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 But there's a lot of places doing it right is, is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put your ax away for a minute, Paul, because <laughs> we've ground it like and it, you, I mean, it's not a bad ax to grind. But but it like that place is the example that honestly is is at least as far as I've I've seen the exception to the rule where nowadays there's there really are a lot of venues out there that are being a whole lot more transparent in part because they have to be, but also in part because. It's okay to be now, you know, we can, we don't have to put on these airs of like, oh, everything is hunky dory. It's like, well, a year ago, it wasn't, you know, and two years ago, it definitely wasn't. So like, you you know, we can all just be honest with each other that, yeah, you know, sometimes things are failures. Sometimes things don't go as well as we wanted them to go. So now let's just be, let's just be honest with each other and and do that. And and like I said, I've, I've experienced a lot of venues lately where that is exactly the mentality and everybody's really kind to each other. 
everybody wants to have a successful evening and there is business to be done, but it's all done in a, in a very kind way and very transparent and honest way. And just be ready for that when you're, you know, when you're dealing with some of these places, sure. uh, because it, it can work out really don't, you know, don't think if somebody says, oh, we're doing a, a gig for ticket sales, that that's just like immediately walk away. It might be a walk away. Like <laughs> in your scenario, there, there were there were three other tips to that iceberg. And it was like, ah, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this is a problem. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I the net net of these three things together, I, I'm actually thinking of punting the rest of the gigs there. Like, mm. I don't think it's going to get better. Right, and, it might um, not get better. Yeah, exactly. Right. And yep. you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna drive our crowd to a ticketed thing, we're gonna drive our crowd to a place where we're not gonna have that type of stress. But it, I won't do it. But one of the guys in my band said, "Give them exactly as much cancellation notice as they just gave you our next uh, one, which yeah. is which is about three and a half weeks, right?" So I won't do that. I no. will. I will uh, yeah, be a little it, more professional, but. Yeah, it never, I mean, I certainly, I've had to cancel a gig the day of and like, like that's, it's awful, but I would never do it as a tit for tat with a place. Like right. that's just not, that, that, that will come around to get you in <laughs> some way. Uh, we got an interesting email from listener Henry. He says, uh, have you guys ever discussed wireless head worn mics for live performances? So the, the short answer is no. I'll, I'll, I'll keep reading his question here, though. Uh, he continues, being the leader, lead guitar player and lead singer, it's nice to be able to move around and sing at the same time. Also, there's plenty of times I want to sing a note longer, but I need to quickly look down and hit the right pedal button to go into a solo or what have you. There are a lot of choices out there. And for me, money really isn't the most important thing. Quality, performance and fit are he says i currently have a sure wireless headset with the ta4f connector that goes into my sure wireless body pack but the sure that i currently have is relatively inexpensive and bulky i'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on this and he and i actually had a little conversation back and forth and uh you, you know my i have i have always stayed away from using headset mics i, I know there are drummers that use them in fact I, our, our friend buddy gibbons uh, and I have had this conversation because he does use a uh, headset mic. I I don't like having to blend harmonies uh, without the ability to affect some mic technique, you know, moving closer or further to the microphone. Now, there are some sound engineers that tell me, I don't want you to do that. You know, you stay on the mic. I'll blend your harmonies. If they know our songs and our material, that works out great. If they don't, then it's awful. But um, But it can work very, very well. But I've never I've never done the headset mic thing, uh, and I'm curious about everybody out there. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Paul, have you ever done the headset mic thing? I've never done it. I actually just saw a friend of mine, uh, Chris Bigford, has a country band, and and same thing. He's a guitar player. He likes to wander around. Yeah. It's part of his entertaining looks. It used to be a little stigmatized, right? It used to be a little, a little too janet jackson right yeah Gar be, garth brooks right? kind of changed some of this yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. so um it makes sense to me i mean you know as a guy who kind of looks through the lens of what's best for the performance yeah um i i would say it doesn't it doesn't it's not stigmatized anymore it's and it makes sense especially for a, a, a musician who's moving around yeah um yeah the blending thing i don't i don't know how to answer that i mean you can, obviously you can't you can't blend. You can't do proximity slide. blending. You have to do, yeah. It, yeah, you have to do volume blending is, is how you, right. your or, tonality or your, blending. Yeah. Or your, um, your sound engineer, you know, rolls you back when you're a background singer versus yes. or when you're doing harmonies. Yeah. So I guess there, and, and that's all a function of, uh, you know, is, is the performer able to, to accomplish those things that either himself you know, through the volume control or have an engineer write it. So, but, or if you're not like, like in, I know I in, Henry, good, in Henry's case, he's the only, he's the lead singer. He, yeah. you know, he never sings harmonies. So it's not as much of an issue. Uh, that part of it isn't as much of an issue for him, but you know, there are the tool for the job. Right. And it seems like it's the right tool. If you're a performer who moves around and that's part of your gig and, you know, and the, and the quality, you know, I know most of the major mic manufacturers make, make one of those now. Um, seems like, seems like it's a good thing. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I'm curious what people out there use. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'll, we'll assemble it and share it, and uh, we'll get back to Henry with it and everybody back. I, I would also say that I don't think anybody in the audience you know, gives a damn. All, all they know is whether they're enjoying the show or not. So I, I would That's say you know, yeah. the, the musician's perspective on this is less important. So let me, than, let me uh, ask an important over. question, though. Which is more offensive to the, uh, to the audience? Is it cargo shorts a music stand or a headset mic. I, I need to prioritize these things, Paul, because it's this... the holy, holy trilogy. I would, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, again, it's, it's the, I guess it depends which audience, right? So, you know, if you ask musicians, most of them, you know, it seems like, it seems like 70, 30, 70% of musicians say none of that matters. As long as my music is good. 30% of musicians say, no, it's the total package, you know, and if you're looking at a pad, you're not looking at the audience. And if you're, and if you, you know, don't give care enough about what you're wearing, you know, if you don't think that matters, you know, I would, I would say from this conversation, the headset mic is not on that list. I know. I just figured I'd throw it out there. Yeah. But we can put the heart, you know, Hulk asking man. for harmonica players back on. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Kellen. No. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He actually plays the harmonica quite well. It's and, and. And uses it judiciously. There, there was some. There uh, was an ex, there was an extended conversation that I did not share that went into. Well, you know, you don't want to have a harmonic in every song because then everybody leaves, and so, like they, you know, they they, they know what they're doing. Yeah. You just use the use the Neil Young metrics. Unless you're Charlie Musselwhite, then then that's a different thing. But uh, <laughs> I think I think most most bands, most rock bands, no more than Neil would than Neil would. There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Ah, oh, fun stuff. I like this. Fun. It's good. We have anything else, or are we uh, we calling it here? Um, oh, I got one more funny thing to share. You please so, do. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to play a civic concert series this year. We've actually played it for quite a while. The person who's booked us for quite a while is gone, and there's a new person who I'm not sure she wanted the job, but she got the job. Sure. Right. And again, we've played it for years. Great. We got asked to play it again. Great. And I got asked to provide, um, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the word, basically she wanted me to assure that we are accountable for the copyright, um, um, accountabilities for performing cover songs. And so I sent her a note back saying, you know, that's really the, the venue that, you know, has the accountability, you know, it, if the attorneys for the, for the copyright organization, they're going to go after anybody. It's, it's going to be the venue. So yeah, um, that's, you know, that's how that you. works. Yeah. So I think she took the letter of the law, took it back to the, and it's a decent sized city lawyers and said, well, you know, here's what they're saying. So she sends me back and said, okay, we took a license with BMI. Great. Go check every song you're going to play against this list and send back to me a list of songs you're going to play. Now, a, kind of a BS step that, you know, I've never had to do before and kind of a hassle. However, if you go to this site for BMI and you type in glory days, there are 409 glory days. I mean, A, you're kind of immersed in how unoriginal so many original song titles are. Yeah. You can filter and kind of, you know, get to it, but it just, you know, it's another step, right? But um I don't know. Have you ever heard of anything like this where you had to actually, you know, prove that uh, that your song list meets someone's licensing capabilities? No, no. the the only The only thing that I've heard about with this is the reverse of it, where if you're an original band, you can choose to go to the 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 site for whichever rights organization you work through. And record a log that you played your original songs at this venue. And then you will get, you know, you get to double dip a little bit because you, yeah. yeah, you know, you got, hopefully you got paid for the gig and then, and then you get yeah. paid for your songs having been played. Uh, you can go in and, and do that too. But no, I've never heard about people asking for this in advance. It, I mean, this is clearly, I know they have high paid lawyers and all that stuff, but it's clearly a, a, Mm -hmm. novice rookie stance. Like they don't quite understand what it is they're doing. Um, right. And, and so that's the scenario that they're in because no, you don't have to log every song. What they want to know is, you know, how many patrons can you fit in your venue? 
and what, you know, how often, what hours, how many hours a week do you have live music? And there might be some other metrics or something. And, and then yeah. they calculate what your fee is. And that's the end of that. You know, they don't care. And word to the wise, list. word to the wise is BMI database. I had to check against no Springsteen, no Tom Petty, no Prince, no Neil Diamond. So I held the, I, I played the Sweet Caroline card and said, I guess no, no Sweet Caroline sing along in your town. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just suggested to them that, you know, they've taken a, a far too litigious perspective on this and that, you know, rather than having lawyers determine set lists, you want the people playing for you to give you the best show that they can. And so you might want to take a broader look at it and talk to other people who are doing it in a different way. This is interesting because I'm looking at your at, at the the list. I'm assuming it's BMI song view, which is at repertoire.bmi.com. And I'll we'll put a link in the show notes for it. But they say that this database looks up not just BMI songs or BMI works, but also ASCAP works. So I'm curious where Springsteen is registered. As an artist, you can only register a piece of work with one agency at a time. Uh, otherwise, yep. then you're double dipping and you're you're double dipping in a in a not OK way. Uh so, I mean, it's possible that like they're with that Springsteen's with CSAC, CESAC, which is the other one. But that would kind of surprise me that they're not yeah. like I wonder who either this database is not entirely accurate or You're doing repertoire.bmi.com. Yeah, that's where I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yep. it says right there out. that that's a that's combined ASCAP and yep. BMI, and so and then they star they star the songs that are registered with BMI. Yeah, I see that. So yeah. it may bring it may bring up other other uh, search results, but it tells you which ones that are actually registered. Yeah, that's weird, man. Weird, weird. Anyway. Yeah. So that was that, that's my closing anecdote. Is is just a strange story. And actually, one last thing. I actually I have another you know, thing saying, too. It turns out so <laughs> we're, we're we're good here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually have seen for all of the initial going into summer um, euphoria, and we were both saying things are back and, you know, it may not last forever, but things are back. I've actually seen some cancellations and some hedging on some stuff um, as we're kind of getting into the summer. Now, maybe that's a, it's a reality of economy things. That, that is entirely possible. Sure. But I would just say it's interesting to watch that pendulum because it's, it you know, it, it pinged towards like full steam ahead, I would say it's 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 rolling back a little bit in terms of the reality of some of the things that came out of the, the early enthusiasm, my perspective. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think um, that, that we're seeing some of that too, where there's, you know, some like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't be quite so eager. Let's see what happens. So, yeah. Some I, people see their fortune by having a salsa night. So there you go. <laughs> I I had an interesting experience. It was a wonderful experience. I should I should say right out of the gate. Uh, on Friday night, I went to see in a, in essence my band play, which is weird uh, because usually I'm I'm with them. In fact, on Thursday I was with them. Uh, we I'm talking about Bitter Pill. We played the Middle East uh, in Cambridge, Mass, which is a club that. I had never played before and had always wanted to. It, it was, you know, it's kind of one of these storied legendary places that's, I mean, it's a dive and it's wonderful, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but I had never played there before. So we wanted to play in there Thursday night with a great bill. And it was a, it was a, it was a fun night. It was a good gig. Uh, everything worked out well. I, I had, uh, and I'll talk about the, the Friday night gig where I went to see the band, but, uh, the, there were four bands on the bill. We were the first band, so we sound checked last. I did my normal thing with the engineer, where I, you know, said hello. I was nice to him. I asked him what he needed from me, and I said, "Hey, it, it's okay, whichever way this goes. But if it makes sense, and you can feed me a line, I'll take a line for my in ears." And he's like, "Okay, well, let me see how things go. Let me see how timing is, and if we've got time, then yeah, I'll do that for you." And and he did. And then, you know, when we went around the stage to ask uh, where he asked what people wanted in their various monitor wedges when he got to me for my ears, I real I did something that I've done many times, but I realized we should probably share it on the show here. 
Be ready to describe exactly how you want your ears mixed to start if someone else is con in control of it. They they had a Soundcraft board, which theoretically would be a Wi-Fi board, but it they didn't have any a Wi-Fi router with it or anything. So it was not something I could do from the stage. I was going to have to have him do it. And so what I told him was uh, put all three vocals at equal level and then uh, all the instruments that aren't drums – you know, 3 dB below that and also give me some snare drum. And that was it. So, but being able to say that very quickly and in a language that hopefully most engineers would understand gave us a great place to start. Uh, it, it it turned out after we played our sound check song, it was like, okay, well, I, you know, based on the way he has the gains, I need all the vocals, you know, the, take those 3 dB, I'm going to give them back to you. I don't, you know, the vocals were way too loud, but that's fine, right? That's an easy thing to solve. But just knowing what your how to, you know, verbally and efficiently describe the mix you want without it becoming a nightmare is kind of the key. And I and I suppose that's true for a monitor wedge just as as it is for in-ears, although it, it it's a whole lot more sensitive when when it's you know when you're when you're putting in-ears in. But uh yeah. but yeah, it um it it worked out great. The guy, the guy was he was a great engineer. It was a great gig. It was it was interesting. I you know I sat down. It was a house kit, and I sat down and kind of you know I try to move as little as I can, but I put my snare drum in place and you know got everything settled. And then I just started playing. The guy said, "Well, you know I've already uh, sound checked the kit for the other drummers, so I don't need to go line by line for you, but just play for me so I can get a, a level set." And I was playing and I'm like, man, like my hands aren't working today. Like I, this is awful. What's happening? I couldn't figure it out, but it was fine. You know, it lasted all of about 10 seconds. And I was like, okay. And then he's like, all right, is the band ready to play a song? And we're like, yeah. So we play a song and I realized what was happening because the song started with my snare drum, maybe at my navel and it ended with my snare drum approaching my chin. The stool uh, was not locked in. So it was just slowly sinking while I was playing <laughs> during the sound check. And so I locked it in after that and it was fine for the gig, but, uh, but it was one of those, it was one of those interesting things. Uh, but the, yeah, the next night I went and saw bitter pill, bitter pills uh, production of their original production of Billy's uh, children of the grim, which is this musical that, is all sort of based on uh, somewhat on nursery rhymes and things like that. It's, you know, it tells a story and it, it's in bitter pill fashion, but given, I think I mentioned on the show, given my schedule, I was oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Everything. All right. Yeah. yeah no, my, okay. my phone's lighting up. Right <laughs> but it, uh, it based on my schedule, I couldn't do, you know, they, they were doing a, a three weekend run and there was just no way for that to fit. So, um, so yeah, it was it was fascinating to to be able to go see him and that the show is awesome. And there's some songs that I had never heard before that that Billy wrote for the show. Uh one of them called Morning Doves really blew me away. Really well written tune. So it was it was it was great to go see, but it's just it's weird, you know, especially we were on stage together last night and now I'm in the audience and you're playing tonight and you know, it's, it was interesting. But uh, but it was great. I, I enjoyed that. Usually, a mix of emotions when you when your band is playing without you. If 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 you had a great experience, I think that's a kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah, I mean, you, you know what I mean. Like I do. Usually, yeah, it could it could have it could have been weird. Left out. And, yep. Yeah, yeah. No, it didn't feel weird at all. And I think honestly, having played together the night before may have contributed to that. I I, I can't say, but you know, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like we hadn't seen each other. It was, you know, it was like we were all locked in and then it was like, oh yeah, that's right. You guys are doing this thing that I can't do because I had to move my kid home and my other kid was graduating and you know, all this other stuff. So yeah. Yeah. No, it was great. It was, it was awesome. And there's a, a member of the cast there who really blew me away. And I, I mentioned them to Billy afterwards and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and get him to like play with us more. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that. <laughs> more of that. And so I, yeah, I yeah. went and introduced myself to them and it was like, ah, oh, I hope we get to, hope we get to play. And they were like, oh yeah, yeah that'd be amazing. So yeah, good cool. stuff. Good, 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 good. good. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, I was glad it wasn't, it, it really wasn't weird, but I know exactly what you're saying. Like it, it could, it, those kinds of things can be weird. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we just did three Steve jobs. One more things to end the episode. We did. Yeah. I think that's more than he ever did. So there you go. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs>
All right. Well, now we're really out of here. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Let us know your uh, your headset mics and, and yell at us for the other things we got wrong. So we love hearing from you. I found my songs in Songview, all the Go Figure songs that we did years ago. Those are there. By the way, there was no hate directed towards salsa musicians. I love salsa musicians. Not being bumped for them. No. What's, the, what's the one thing we tell salsa musicians? Always be performing. <laughs>